that nice introduction. I had written out a longer introduction for you to use, but you didn't use it. <laughs> That's OK. Um, anyways, uh, I did get off a plane this morning. I got on the plane in New York at 6 p.m. on Saturday, arrived here Monday morning at 6 a.m. within four minutes, so it was exactly 24 hours. And I felt fine until about 3 o'clock this afternoon. At that point, I started taking a dive, but I'm back on track, and I know I can make it, Coach. If I fall asleep during this speech, please, somebody kick me. <laughs> Anyways, let me thank the Temasek Foundation for bringing us all together. And you should know that Bloomberg really is glad to be a partner in this summit. And I want to give my special thanks to Madam Ho and Delon Pillay for their leadership. It really is great to be here in Singapore after all the challenges of the last two years. Uh, cities and nations in every region continue to grapple with the pandemic, and Singapore has a key role to play, we think, in helping the world respond and recover. Singapore, as we all know, is and has been for an awful long time a center of innovation and global commerce and trade. It is also one of the most important locations for Bloomberg and been a key hub for our business in the Asia region. So I want to thank everyone who is helping to build a brighter future here. The world needs you to be successful. Our company is looking forward to opening the Bloomberg New Economy Forum here this week. And at its heart is a conference about partnership. And the reason is, all the big challenges that we face require collaboration across the East and the West, and across business, government, universities, non-government organizations, and philanthropy. And the more we work together, the faster we can make progress. And that's certainly true with the pandemic. It's also a battle against climate change. The good news is there's no longer doubt about the world, that the world has to fight that battle. Going into the UN's COP26 conference this month, around 75% of global G GDP was covered by some form of commitment to reach net zero emissions. We are making progress. We're just not making progress fast enough. And while much of the attention at COP was focused on national governments, the fact of the matter is they can't take on climate change alone. All of us have a role to play. And today, I just wanted to take a few minutes to mention some of the ways philanthropy can help speed up progress, not just on climate change, but on all of the big challenges we face. First, philanthropy has the power to bring people together and build connections. And today's conference is a great example. Our foundation is helping to lead a number of global co coalitions working to target climate challenge. One of them is the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, which is made up of almost 100 of the world's biggest cities, including Singapore. We're also helping to lead the Global Covenant of Mayors, which brings together more than 11,000 cities that are home to 1 billion people, including many cities in Asia. These coalitions help leaders share ideas and highlight policies that are working so that they can be spread around the world. They help cities speak with one unified voice, and the world is listening. Not long ago, national governments were the only ones at the table in global climate talks. At COP26, cities, along with states, regions, and businesses, were given a larger role for the first time. And the UN is finding new ways to ensure that contributions are measured and that their efforts are supported. Second, philanthropy can spur innovation. It can be hard for governments to take risks on untested ideas. The politics just generally don't allow that, even if they should. Private dollars, however, can help fund experiments that if successful, governments can then scrape up and it avoids those political pitfalls. For instance, our foundation created a competition called the Mayor's Challenge. It invites cities to submit bold ideas and then provides funding to implement the best of them. In the US, we created something called the American Cities Climate Challenge. Cities submitted comprehensive plans for tackling climate change, and we're providing funding and other resources to help those cities bring plans to life. Third, 
philanthropy can arm people with the tools and resources they need to act. For instance, countries have strong economic and public health initiatives to switch from coal to clean energy. But many developing countries lack the public resources to make upfront investments in clean power, a challenge that the pandemic has only made worse. Sometimes countries lack the right data or have policies that tilt the market away from clean energy. Our foundation is working to knock down those barriers. In Indonesia, for example, we're helping to identify potential sites for new solar installations and to develop business models that ensure those projects are viable for public and private investment. Fourth, philanthropy can also empower communities to push for change. Over the last 10 years, our foundation has helped communities transition from coal that, and the deadly pollution that it causes to clean energy with all of its benefits. We've helped close more than 65% of all U.S. coal plants and more than half of Europe's in the last few years. Just think about that. Working without government, we've been able to close 65% of these power plants in America and 50% in Europe. You can imagine what we could do if we had government on our side. And at COP26, the UN Secretary General has announced a major expansion of our global coal work and our new goal is to close a quarter of all remaining coal plants and cancel all proposed coal power plants by the year 2025. It's an ambitious goal and will require a lot of collaboration, but I think there's nothing that we can't accomplish if we work together. Just think about what's going on. Look at the television of forest fires and droughts and floods. Look at people suffering. We have to do something. Climate change is happening, and the second derivative is positive. It's getting worse and getting worse at a faster rate. Today, there's a chance to support the kinds of partnerships that we need and to share the great ideas that will fuel them to stop climate change. But we need everybody's help. So thank you, and if you can take that message back to your organizations, this is not a joke, and it's not going to wait for us. We have to focus on this now. People are dying virtually every day. So thanks again for being here. I'm sorry to end on a dismal note, but this is the future of the world. This is what my children and grandchildren and yours and us as well are going to have to live with. We have to do something about it. So thanks for being here. And I'm told I'm going to sit and Jennifer's gonna ask me some questions. Yes. I have no good. idea about what, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, do join us there. Thank you so much for that. You packed a lot of ideas in there. Gosh, I was trying to follow. You know, I couldn't keep up with it at all. I can get you a copy of it. Okay, that's exactly what I need. So thank you for being with us. I know you arrived just this morning. 24-hour flight, you said. So welcome to Singapore, our country, which is also a city. And you love cities. What makes cities so effective for you? Uh, what makes some, a city effective is people get together. W what you have to do is find reasons for people to act in their, soul, so in their own interest that is taking them in the direction that you'd like to move them. So for example, if you want people to close coal-fired power plants, what we've tried to do is to get the employees of the power plant and the customers of the power plant and the stockholders in the power plant, the owners, to all work together and to say to the management of the power plant, look, we want you to do this or we're gonna fire you and bring somebody else in. We want you to do this or we're gonna sell your stock and buy another one. We want you to do this or we're gonna go elsewhere and find energy sources elsewhere and get jobs elsewhere. And so the owners of the power plant take a look and they say, ah, it's in our interest to do that. And then you also have to find a way so that they can do it without going bankrupt and without having so many people gang up on them. And the good news is that um, the new energy is really becoming much more dependable and much cheaper and much more available. We're improving the ability to transfer energy from one point to another with less attenuation. We're able to generate energy much cheaper, and all of these things go, are going in the right direction. 
So you're starting at the cities first, with the cities first, and then- Well, the, the cities are where, keep in mind, the cities are where people live. And so if you want to reduce energy consumption, you've got to go into the cities where people are running their air conditioners all day, or people are driving cars that are polluting, those kinds of things. And that's why mayors are so important at, at worldwide in this plan. Federal governments can do things State governments can do things, but it's the city governments that really deal with the people day in and day out, understand what their problems are, what they need to get to work and to feed their families and provide an education for their kids. And they're the ones that can lead. You know, it's interesting listening to you. you you're a person of optimism. You felt you had to apologize for having that dismal message in your speech. I don't know that it's dismal. I, I wrote a book with a guy named Carl Pope uh, from the Sierra Club, uh, Climate of Hope. Um, we have the tools to do what we need to do. In fact, I have always believed that for almost all of the problems that we have to face, whether it's education or climate or communicable diseases or whatever, we have the science, we know what to do. What we don't have is the political will to do it. And so I look at all of these problems as uh, political problems. And if you do that, you approach them differently than you would. We, you can always do more research and find more ways to create energy, to educate kids, to do whatever you want to do. But in the end, we've got to deal with the politics that keep us from doing things even when we know that what we're doing is wrong. So how do you decide? I know for you evidence data is very important. I mean, it's, it's how you make your profits, which go into philanthropy. But, you know, how, you, how do you decide on the projects? Well, we look for things, my, let me just step back for a second. I have a company, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary, and I think it's fair to say we've been reasonably successful. And I'm well taken care of, thank you. Uh, so I've committed to give 100% of the company's product, profits to our foundation. Our foundation works on climate change, we work on education, we work on public health issues, work on culture, you know, a whole bunch of things. Yeah. And we look for things, first and foremost, that there's a need, and second criteria is something that other people aren't willing to work on because they just don't wanna run the risk of trying something and not have it work. And I said when I was just talking before, uh, a lot of times, the Government can't do things. In government, you have to sort of guarantee to the public that what you're spending their money on is going to work. And you can't do that if you're gonna innovate. Some things are gonna work, some things are not gonna work. In, in fact, in science, if you go down a path that turns out to be a dead end, you have done something good. You have added to our body of knowledge. You've told other scientists they don't have to go down those paths because they've already been explored. They can focus on other ones where a solution may lie. But explain to the public why, it's a, it's st why we still should fund scientists that got to dead ends. Indeed. It just, in a world of social media where everything, everybody knows everything, everybody has a microphone, and nobody understands what's going on, yep. no matter what they say. We, we know, I think, less today about what's going on than we did 20 years ago. And in, we've given a lot of technology, we've given a lot of information, we've sold a lot of uh, uh, apps for, and, and made Apple and Facebook and everybody else uh, uh, more popular and, 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 and made a lot of money, but we haven't got the public to understand complex things. And one of the most obvious examples is just look around the room, everybody with masks. Why the mask? Because of COVID-19. And what's the problem? The problem is we yet do not know all the things you need to know about this disease. Normally it would take 10 years to build a vaccine and during that time you would get a lot of knowledge. Today we did it in, amazingly in a year or two but you don't have the experience of doing long-term testing and that sort of thing. So here we are, and, and people say, wait a second, the science, the other day, this guy Fauci said, we should not wear masks. 
Today, he says, we should wear masks. The headline in the paper is Fauci lies. Well, the science then did not think it was transmitted that way or something like this. And the science today is different. And the public, it's, how we're going to educate the public, I think is one of the great conundrums, one of the great problems we have. How do you educate them as how science works and that you can't be specific about everything um, and, and you have to go and if the science changes, change and it's not a, it, it's a, progressive thing. It's something that's good that science changed. We found something new and we changed to respond to the new information. The trouble is, of course, you get blasted in the papers. Ah, indeed. You know, it's one reason why we're all here as well. No one can do it alone. Governments can't do it alone. Right. Philanthropists can't do it alone. How did you persuade other philanthropists to work along with you to solve bigger problems? Well, I think, number one, if you're trying to get other philanthropies to uh, join in and work on something, there is this community, which you're a part of, and some people who work for me are a part of, where all of the people that work on the foundations and run them, they all know each other, they have dinners together, they share papers together, and so if you want to go out and find others, they know who to make the phone call to. So, and. It's very difficult if you have a foundation to find projects that you want to work on that have the potential and where your money's not going to be wasted because they have too, more money than they need. They're into the political problem world rather than the science world. Uh, and I can just tell you, looking at, at, at my company, you know, we've been so successful. It's, we're working on lots of things. But if you're going to give away big money, and Bill Gates and, Rob, and uh, uh, Buffett are perfect examples of that, if you have a, a lot of money, it's just not easy. It takes a lot of research if you're going to do it intelligently. It takes a lot of time. I, mean, I remember, never forget, Gates called me one time, and he had put a billion dollars or something like that into eradicating polio. Right. I remember as a kid, the cover of Life magazine, they had a gymnasium about the size of this room, and it was full of iron lungs with kids in them, and all those kids died. Okay. At least I think they did. And polio is a real bad thing, and there's a chance of getting rid of it. And so we had given him a large amount of money. And then he called me back, um, so this was a year later, and said, we still have to go the, the, some places where they haven't eradicated or whatever. He said, could you do me, could you see yourself giving another large amount of money, the same thing? And he'd written me this little letter. So I looked at Patty Harris, who runs our foundation, and showed it to her. We sat closer to each other than you and I, okay? Right. And um, she said, well, you know, we really have a chance here. And I said, okay. And so I just sent him back a, a text saying, we're in. He'd asked us for this large amount of money. And we didn't hear back from him. <laughs> and three days later, finally somebody called and said, Bill didn't know what you meant when you said, we're in. We, we'll and when he realized we were going to give him all the money. The Foundation will call you sooner whenever you say we're in. Anyways, I'll call you. Indeed. No, I'm glad you'll call. But when you got that call, and it was for an area which was new to you? What was going through your mind? Because that's where we're at right is, is now. Is there a chance to really make a difference? You, no guarantees in life, but is there a chance? And if you're doing something and you just got to do more of it, there's a good chance that you're really going to be the, the, uh, going in the right direction. It's when you're the first one going out. Yeah. Um, there was a philanthropist in the United States uh, who name I won't mention, but he died in, in the last few years. And I got on the phone with him and he was crying. Literally, you know, somebody my age and he was crying. Why? Because we had talked about this and he said he had given so much money to one thing that we were working on and it wasn't working and he thought he'd wasted so much of his time and, and money. It was sad. It's sad, it's sad. There are a lot of questions coming in as well. Um, you know, part of my regret is I said we'd read straight off pigeonhole. Can you see it? Can you read it? No, I can't. I can't read see it. it as well. <laughs> my regret. I mean, I was supposed to bring up a second iPad. Okay, I, I'll read a few out, and you tell me which one you want. There's one that says, "Do you have 
a next big single big issue? Yeah. Do you have a next single big issue you want to tackle? Um, well, I'm looking uh, towards um, finding the big issues. We have some, and this one I've talked about, it's going to be a pretty big thing. Um, I also, uh, for the uh, college, uh, university I went to, uh, gave them a couple billion dollars to make it needs blind for kids, and we're building some new buildings there, and we're doing a lot of research and education, and that's great. But I have to face the issue going down the road. I'm 79 years old, and at some point I'm not going to be around. And the foundation goes, or the, my company goes to the foundation, and then they have to sell it because of tax laws. And so what are they going to do when they have an, all of a sudden an enormous amount, I hope it's enormous, enormous amount of money coming in where they, by law, have to give some of it away a, a certain rate. Uh, for ethical reasons, I think you want to give away even more than that. But how do you find the big things? One of the things you could do is you could just say, let's take 10 foundations and give 10% to each and let them worry about it. I'm not happy with that idea. I want to see if there are things that nobody else has the interest or maybe the courage to go and do it. And I understand why boards are very sensitive. They don't want to be criticized in the newspaper and that sort of thing. If there's the least bit of hint of scandal, somebody's background, somebody said something 25 years ago when yeah. they were in college and now it's the end of the world. I don't have to worry about that. You know, I've been there. The, I was mayor of New York for 12 years. There's nothing bad you could write about me that hasn't been written. I mean, you know, OK, yeah, thank you very much. I, one guy screamed at me. I was giving a commencement speech. I think it was the University of Michigan. And he screamed a slur. I crossed the big stadium, which had 60 or 70,000 people in it, literally. And he screamed what I could do with myself. And I just looked up and said, well, thank you very much. You made me feel at home. And everybody laughed. He sat down in shame, and we went on. But it's, you, you got to find other things. And I think we can take some risks that others are not willing to do, just because I'm not sensitive to it. No, but knowing that you're going to be having this shift in the mandates in the power, what have you baked into the mandates that must be carried on? Say that again? For your philanthropy. You know, you, are, are there certain things you're going to insist that even as it moves into a new management? Yeah, um, but that's, you always have those kinds of things change and you have to deal with them. And remember, in a lot of these things, there is no right answer. So at least you got to try. OK. All right. That's what you want. At least try, stick your neck out. We actually have 44 seconds, but I think we can get another question in. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us. <laughs> <laughs> OK, there's one here about nuclear power. And if you think it's the, one of the solutions to reduce carbon, Emissions. I think uh, nuclear is one of the uh, sources that we have to use. Um, it's dependable. It is safe as long as you've done it with uh, uh, lots of thought. Um, there's been some tragedies in uh, Tokyo and other places, or in Japan and other places. But um, there's nothing that doesn't have some uh, potential problems. And we desperately need to stop polluting. And nuclear does that. And if it was politically feasible to do it, we should do it. Uh, a guy came to see me the other day. He's just taking over Commonwealth uh, Edison in uh, uh, Chicago, in Illinois. And they have a lot of nuclear power. Right. And this is a guy who had worked for me, and I trust him. And we talked a lot about nuclear power. And I'm convinced you can do it safely. Um, and you just have to take precautions. But, you know, you can put up a power line and somebody can run into it. You can stick your hands into your, your fingers into a 110 volt plug and die. We just got to be reasonable. But I would go ahead with nuclear power, yes. Not the only source. You want to have diversity. We've depended on hydro, except in the United States, there's an awful lot of these rivers that are so low now, the reservoirs are almost empty. Hydro doesn't work all the time. Right. Uh, you can have uh, sun-based things. Uh, the trouble is that uh, 
Uh, sun doesn't shine all the time, certainly not at night and even bad weather. Um, you can go and uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting, wind power in America, we have an awful lot of wind offshore, uh, but it's in deep water and you just really can't have something sitting on the bottom holding up the uh, uh, windmill. But uh, there's some floating, people have been working on floating uh, windmills which you can just, with one cable to the floor, that would make a difference, except sometimes the wind doesn't blow. Right. So there's, there's something, everything that has a risk or a downside, uh, and if you, you're much better off if you have a diversity of sources because you never know what's going to happen. Indeed. So last question. I would questions. put nuclear in that. You can see it's, you know, they're screaming at us, time's up. But what are you hopeful about? Let's end with that. What am I hopeful about? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing is the Secretary General of the United Nations is a very smart, very astute, very hardworking guy who is committed to making uh, us do the right thing on, with COP26 and right. other things. And Gutierrez is a great guy. Um, science is going in the right direction. I'm not sure when they're going to have fusion, but you know, it's one of these things that's 10 years off and maybe always will be 10 years off, but there's potential there. Uh, solar panels get bigger get, and, and more efficient all the time. And if the Chinese want to sell low-priced power uh, solar panels to us and solve our energy problem, send it in. Yep. Love it. I wanted them to do more of it. We should say thank you. Um, and there's a lot of smart people out there who are working on the problem. And some of them will come up with things you'll say, you know, why didn't we know that? Why didn't we do that? But battery technology is getting better, transmission is getting better, um, generation is getting more efficient and cheaper. So the, the problem is not that we're going to do it, it's the problem is when you d do it. Uh, how long does it take? And if you look at a place, the thing that's most worrisome to me is not China. Uh, China, it's a political problem. They can solve the problem. India is much more difficult because very diverse government, very diverse population, and a lot of people, there are people, you see pictures of them carrying coal in their hands and their arms out of a coal mine. The job issue is much more serious there than it is any place else. But we've got to help them and find a solution because unless America and China and India don't work together, you're not going to get where you need to be. Mike, thank you so much. Collaboration's thank the you, answer. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.